welcome. Good morning and welcome to the launch of the State of Volunteering in Queensland 2021 report. My name is Mara Basanovic and I'm the CEO of Volunteering Queensland and the MC for this event. As I've just indicated, unfortunately, we've got some traffic jams in Queensland, so we have a slight change of proceedings with the Minister speaking a little later. Um, she um, is still on her way here. I begin by acknowledging our First Nations people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today, Mianjan, Brisbane. I recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as both the home of the Turrbal and the Yagara nations and pay respects to their and all elders past, present and future. I extend a warm welcome to all people joining us from across Queensland and indeed Australia through our live streaming of this event and acknowledge the many different First Nations people's lands that you are um, tuning in from today and pay respects to all your elders past, present and future. Well, today is National Volunteer Week, so we thought it would be really fitting to launch our report um, during this special week. National Volunteer Week is the uh, Australia's sort of premier um, celebration of volunteers and the volunteer involving organisations that engage them and enable volunteers to do the best work possible. So throughout this week we have numerous um, events both in Queensland and across Australia. So to all the volunteers in our room, thank you for all you do. And if you're associated with a volunteer involving organisation, thank you also for enabling your volunteers to contribute their potential to making Queensland a better place. I'm also delighted to announce when, when she does arrive um, the presence of um, the Honourable Leanne Enoch MP, Minister for Communities and Housing, um, Minister for Digital Economy and, the, and Minister for the Arts. Um, the Minister will, as I said, be joining us shortly. Claire O'Connor, Director General of the Department for Communities, Housing and Digital Econom Economy. Mike Wassing, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Fire and Emergency Services. Mary Lou Gittins, OAM, Chair of Queensland Water and Land Carers, who are co-sponsors of the report we are launching today, together with the Government of Queensland. Paul Muller, Muller, Managing Director of the Institute of Project Management, our research partner for this project. Natasha Doherty and Deborah Nisbet, representing the Volunteering Queensland Board, and all esteemed guests and supporters of Volunteering Queensland and Volunteering in Queensland. Today marks a really special milestone for our state. We have our first ever report into the value of volunteering in our state. It is a really comprehensive report and we're very proud of the work done and of the findings. They quite, they were really uh, quite astonishing and I think Paul will, give great, um, will take great pleasure in leading you through the findings. This report has provided much needed empirical evidence um, upon which to inform the future of volunteering in Queensland. So I hope that it is put to good use over the next four or five years. This morning we will hear from Minister Enoch once she arrives. We'll hear from Paul Muller and also an expert panel who will discuss the key methodology and findings of the report and respond to any questions from the floor. It now gives me great pleasure to invite Paul Muller to come up to the podium and also to speak on the report. I warmly welcome Paul um, to, and ask him to provide valuable insights and findings highlighted in the report. Prior to co-founding the Institute of Project Management, Paul enjoyed 15 years of senior management experience across Australia, Asia and Europe in a wide range of project-driven businesses. As a PhD scholar, Paul was engaged at the Australian Innovation Research Centre, extending his postgraduate qualifications in international sports management and law. This is the fifth state of volunteering that Paul, through the Institute of Project Management, has led, including one in WA, two in Tasmania, one in Queensland, 
and one just about to be launched in New South Wales. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Mara. Thanks, Mara, and um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Mara said, this is exciting. Um, I'll try not to nerd out too much on the numbers and, and everything in here, but really, this is the story uh, of $84 billion, but there's a lot more to the story than just this. You'll see, um, for those of you who, who look at the full report, that it's broken into three sections. The, the first section looks at the characteristics of volunteering. In other words, how do people volunteer in Queensland? Um, and at what levels do they volunteer? And what drives them to volunteering as well? Or potentially stops them volunteering or volunteering more? The second section looks at volunteer involving organisations um, and what drives and motivates them, what, um, what, are, what are their expenses and what are the big issues and challenges that they face. The, the third section looks at the costs and benefits of volunteering. So we, when we talk about the value of volunteering, that's really only part of the story. And the, the big number is a, is a very impressive number, obviously. But what does it cost us to get that to that number? And yeah, what are the benefits that flow from volunteering as well? And one of the things that we'll talk about here is really that 84 billion that we're going to keep coming back to is really a very conservative underestimate of the, the true value of volunteering. So um, about volunteering, the first section, basically we did a, a, an online survey of 1500 Queenslanders um, and it was a, a representative uh, survey. Um, the, um, it was done between November and December last year um, and ask them about their volunteering in the previous two, uh, in, in, in 2019 and in 2020. Um, we made sure that we had uh, set quotas that we were trying to achieve in terms of gender balance, uh, age. We looked at 10 year age cohorts from 18 to, um, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, etc. cetera. Um, we ensured that it was, they were representative of household income as well, so that all income levels were, were accounted for in the report. Um, and we also made sure that we distinguished those who volunteer in major cities or participated in major cities from other regional um, and rural and remote parts of Queensland as well. So we had a really good cross-section of Queenslanders. Then we uh, post-weighted the results so that we had a, a reliable picture of what the state looks like. Um, we also took advantage of the fact um, that you know, 2020 wasn't a typical year necessarily in terms of volunteering given the impacts of COVID. So we, went, we did go back and look at 2019 as well to see if there were any, significance, uh, any significant differences in volunteering behaviour over those years. And here's what we found. Uh, about 3 million adults, so people aged 18 and over, uh, volunteer in Queen, volunteered in Queensland in 2020. That's roughly three quarters of the adult population of, of Queensland. And I'll talk a little bit later about why that figure is so much larger and, and potentially different from some of the other figures you may have, may have seen quoted elsewhere. But yeah, three out of every four Queenslanders in the last year did participate in volunteering in some way, shape or form. So they gave roughly 900 million volunteer hours um, and on, on average volunteered about 5.7 hours per week or 25 hours a month roughly. Um, that, so this was an interesting finding for us as well. Actually more people volunteered in 2020 than compared to 2019. Um, but they reported slightly lower hours um, in terms of the, the actual hours they volunteered as well, um, which was an interesting finding. Given our, I guess, working hypothesis going in that people were going to vol be volunteering less in 2020 because of COVID and its impacts. But we'll see, you know, uh, as we go through why that can potentially be explained. About 14% of people, uh, and this is of, of the volunteers, about 14% of them only volunteered in an organisational setting. So the only time they gave was to a, an organisation that involved volunteers. Um, about 30% uh, only volunteered informally. So by informally, they, they did their volunteering within the community. 
And to give clarity, the, the definition of an informal volunteer is someone who gives time to someone who's not a member of their household or their family. So to, to someone you know, outside their immediate house or familial circumstance. And just over half of our volunteers in the state gave their time both in formal and informal settings. Uh, so contributed in both ways. Um, almost half did their volunteering in their local community. So um, within their, their, their immediate geographic region, but outside of their home. Um, and an interesting finding was about just over one quarter did their volunteering online. Um, and there was a notable difference and a notice, notable shift in the pattern of volunteering behaviour um, between 2019 and 2020 is a lot of their people found a way to bring their volunteering into their home or online. Um, so uh, the, the, some of that high profile volunteering going overseas and things like that only made up a very slither of a segment of all volunteering in both years. Um, you know, most of the volunteering, you know, as you can see there, occurs you know, within people's local community. Um, so these were the, the motives for volunteering. This is, this is what got people, you know, why people were attracted to volunteering in the first place. Um, and you can see a lot of those um, categories up there would be familiar to you. Um, so, you know, to help others for social connection, to, to use skills and experiences to support a cause. Um, so those are the, the drivers of volunteering. And we go into that in a little bit more detail in the report. Um, what we also did was take the opportunity to ask, well, why don't you volunteer more? Um, you know, what stops you from giving more time as a volunteer? And the biggest consideration was, uh, was sorry, time, a, a lack of available time. But given the nature of the survey, we also had a, a pretty strong sample of people who don't volunteer. And we asked them, well, why don't you volunteer as well? Um, and found a different set of results. Again, time was the biggest driver. Um, but checking notes here, <laughs> um, it was very surprising that, that only one in five people turned around and said, look, I'm just not interested in volunteering. So, you know, that was, we, we probably expected to see that as a bigger barrier to, to people volunteering. So even among the, the non-volunteers, you can probably reasonably say that four out of five want to volunteer. And you'll see one of the, the, the categories that feature uh, quite strongly is, I've just never been asked. <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't know. Sorry, I'll, I'll check here. Um, yeah, so uh, about 17% of people uh, said, you know, I'm just not sure how to, or I've never been asked to volunteer before as well, um, which, was, which was quite surprising in itself. But again, a, a lot of detail in there, and I encourage you to look at the report. Um, people's futures and future intentions around volunteering. So um, one of the things, people were generally positive uh, about their outlook and, and what they saw as their future uh, participation in volunteering. Um, and um, obviously, of the non-volunteers, there were, were a significant number that said, you know, because of my circumstances, uh, so, you know, nearly 60% nearly three in five saying, you know, I probably won't be volunteering as well. But there was a lot of uncertainty as well. So 30% of non-volunteers were saying, I just don't know whether I'm going to be volunteer, you know, what my volunteering is going to look like in the three years. And as well as the 10% the who said, yeah, I'm going to take it up again. Um, so that uncertainty may well be attributable to the uncertainty, you know, uh, around things like COVID, uh, given that health was often was cited quite strongly as a reason uh, why people couldn't volunteer. But the, I suppose one of the key things is the, the volunteers, the people who don't volunteer aren't a lost cause. And for the main, there are, there's just a lot of uncertainty as opposed to an unwillingness to continue to contribute. So when we looked at the volunteer involving organisations, um, we surveyed, uh, we did an online survey of, of organisations who use and include volunteers uh, and engage with them. Um, we had 594 organisations respond, and importantly for the, the financial and, and economic measures, we had 426 provide financial information for us. Um, and again, there was a reasonable cross-section of respondents uh, across all different sectors. Um, and this, this graph here, again, a lot of detail and I won't go into it, but it showed the, the type of individuals that organisations were involving and including. So nearly three quarters or about three quarters of organisations 
engage people over 65. And we know that people over 65 are very strong in terms of their volunteering. Um, but an interesting finding when we looked across the, the, the age cohorts, there wasn't really a significant difference or a statistically significant difference in how the age cohorts volunteered. They all volunteered at roughly the same level, whether you were 18 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old or 70 years old. There was, there was fairly common um, yeah, contributions to volunteering in that respect. Um, but yeah, um, I guess, suppose this shows the, the diversity of people who do volunteer um, and for organisations where there might be an opportunity to engage with different cohorts and communities. Um, one of the, the we asked organisations about how they recruit their volunteers and word of mouth was the, the obviously the strongest one. So relying on uh, the volunteers and the, the, the community that they include to drive you know, and um, get more volunteer participation from people. Um, great to see new technologies like social media being embraced in this space as well, over half of organisations using that. Um, and things like good old fashioned open days um, are, are still a, a very strong method of recruitment. Um, other strategies used were things like websites, traditional media, uh, using the, the VRCs and volunteering Queensland, um, uh, just general investment in their brand, which people re might recognise as a volunteer brand, um, and other agency referrals. When it comes to um, volunteer retention and how organisations retain their volunteers, um, things like personal connections and relationship building. So being really connected as an organisation to your volunteers was by far uh, and away the biggest factor. Um, but there was a lot of uh, a lot of different and diverse activities that organisations were doing to retain their volunteers. Um, and you'll see in the report a, a more complete list of them. Um, about 30% uh, of organisations indicated that they do reimburse their volunteers, um, which was quite um, positive, as we'll see, because the, the, the cost to individuals, as we'll see shortly, is, is a big factor um, in terms of volunteering. Um, and um, But about 27 or you know, just over a quarter of them saw a drop in the level of um, volunteers, volunteers who are actually claiming reimbursement as well. Um, so that was that was interesting in and of itself. Um, the next section of the report, we asked a, a, a quite a detailed list of what are the important factors, what are the issues and challenges that you face as an organisation now, and how have those factors changed over the last three years? Um, there was, you know, about a third of organisations saw a need over the last three years for a, a, for better volunteer training. Um, they also saw an increase in people wanting to volunteer occasional or regular hours uh, as opposed to, you know, volunteering every Tuesday at two o'clock, sort of uh, program volunteering. Um, we saw um, um, companies, so corporate volunteering, com companies who give their, or organisations who, who donate the time of their employees to volunteer in vol involving organisations. We saw a big drop in the number of com uh, volunteer involving organisations reported a big drop in the number of companies who were willing to engage with corporate volunteering programs. Um, and just a general decrease in the number of people who were actually willing to volunteer as well. We also asked organisations, okay, what are the top three things you need help with? Um, what, what, what are the things that, you know, um, as a sector or, or just generally do you think that, you know, are the biggest issues you need support with? Uh, the things that were reported there, um, volunteer management was by far and away the biggest, the biggest thing that, that organisations felt they needed support with. Um, followed by access to funding grants or sponsorship. So, you know, financial sustainability obviously is an issue. Um, and also, um, you know, organisations felt they needed to do better at volunteer, you know, appreciation, recognition within the organisation as well. Um, and the, the final one was volunteer recruitment, you know, um, which is obviously linked to that finding, that, um, that self-reported finding that, you know, volunteers are disappearing. Um, we, we're seeing people wanting to volunteer less. So in terms of the, the future outlook for, for volunteering from these organisations, um, it was actually 
you know, net positive. Um, so, you know, whereas um, only 18% felt they'd have less volunteers in three years' time, 28% said they expected to have more volunteers in three years' time. But I suppose, again, there was a, a, a quite a significant uncertainty about what the future would look like there. Uh, so that nearly 20% saying, we just don't know. Um, and finally, um, you know, I mean, from that, we can see that, you know, nearly two thirds of organisations said that we'll have, you know, about the same or more volunteers in three years time. So it's a generally optimistic outlook uh, for the volunteer involving organisations. And finally, the, the, the section of the report that brings us to the dollars and cents, um, we basically applied a cost benefit um, uh, methodology. And so apart from Natasha and myself, who else is an economist in the room? Do we have any economists? No, we've all got personality then, that's cool. So um, for, for those of you who really want to nerd out about this, those are the, method of the, the economic methods we used, but let's just not mention that slide again. Um, let's keep it interesting, shall we? Um, so probably the, the big standout um, and something that hasn't really you know, been part of the, the conversation to the extent that it probably should be is that individuals reported on average reaching into their own pocket for about $1,600 um, a year to, in 2020 to support their volunteering. So that equals, you know, um, and only 11.4% of them were actually reimbursed. Um, so basically on, a, on an hourly basis, I'll have to look up the figure um, and, and I won't bore you while I look through pages here, four bucks, just over four dollars an hour it costs people to volunteer. <laughs> so thank you Ricky. <laughs> um, yeah, so just over four dollars an hour uh, it, it costs people to volunteer and we don't really think of that or, or consider that uh, in our thinking and obviously people, some people pay a lot more and some people pay a lot, yes. Um, but yeah, only um, so even though the volunteer involving organisations who responded to our survey, about 30% of them said, yeah, we do reimburse, really only about 10% of the population felt that they were actually or, or reported that they were getting reimbursed. And this is probably a more reliable sample than our, than our convenient sample of volunteer involving organisations. Um, so that's, that's quite an interesting finding in and of itself. But I'll go through the, the numbers now and just explain what they mean. So the, the basically volunteers self-funded their volunteering to the tune of about $4.2 billion. Uh, so that's how much volunteers spent on their volunteering. This is actually yeah, almost twice as much as what the volunteering organisations uh, spent on their volunteers. They spent about $2.2 billion. And we've always, you know, um, I think a lot of us assume that the volunteer involving organisations are doing the, the heavy lifting in terms of managing the costs for volunteers. And they do do uh, a, a very significant job in that respect. But the volunteers are also self-financing themselves a lot as well. Um, there's also the, what we call the opportunity cost of a person's uh, of the, the opportunity costs to, to attach to this. And this is basically, well, if I wasn't volunteering, what else would I be doing? Um, we're, we're asking of volunteers when we talk about their time. So one of the things, you know, the, the easiest thing to compare volunteering to is basically if I wasn't doing an hour of volunteering, I'd be doing, it, doing an hour of paid work. But that's not true for everyone. So for people who are aged over 65, for example, who aren't in the workforce, there's less of them who are giving up an hour of work to volunteer. But if we look at all the people who are in employment across the different age cohorts, and again, this has gone into in the report, we found that volunteers effectively for, foregoed, I'm going to make up words as I go now, uh, pretend that's a, an economic term of significance. Um, so they've, for, they've foregone, that was the word I was looking for, uh, $13.9 billion worth of, worth of um, uh, effective wages to give, the, to, to give as volunteers. And also um, we, we apply a similar methodology when we're looking at the cost of investments as well. So the money spent on volunteering, if that was, you know, if we didn't spend that money on volunteering and we just let it uh, sit in the bank and earn interest, we effectively gave up the opportunity to earn you know, about 50 odd, 60 odd million dollars as well. So the total cost of volunteering was about $20.4 billion. That's how much it cost to, to um, the community 
to enable volunteering in the um, uh, in 2020. In terms of the benefits, though, um, that uh, that you know ten odd billion dollars that people spent to volunteer either as individuals as or organisations, that money flowed through the economy in Queensland. So you know. Um, the, when people bought, you know, supplies or uniforms or equipment or resources for their volunteering, someone benefited from that, the, they made that sale to them, and that created an effective profit to businesses within Queensland of about $1.2 billion. So that spending is actually economically significant in its own right, um, and it creates a lot of value. We also ask people to what extent does volunteering positively or negatively impact on your employment? And we found about half of Queenslanders said, yep, uh, it had a very positive impact on my employment by about this month. We also found about 5% who turned around and said, you know what, it actually has a negative impact on my day job, my volunteering. And that might be through things like, you know, having to miss work or, you know, being not as productive for lack of sleep or, you know, um, or perhaps the employer wasn't as supportive of their volunteering as, you know, or their rostering didn't allow it. So there was, you know, a, a mostly positive impact on employment, but there was a, a, an observable negative impact. But the net impact, if you like, was what we call a productivity premium. And this is a benefit enjoyed by employers, but basically the knowledge, skills and experience that people bring from their volunteering and transfer to their workplace was an effective net benefit to employers of about $40 billion, which is pretty cool. Um, and that, when you contrast that to the figure before, which cited that less and less organisations are willing to participate in corporate volunteering, um, is an interesting juxtaposition and potentially an opportunity too. Um, in terms of the opportunity, um, opportunity costs, um, that's um, uh, misheaded. This should actually be, uh, it should actually say civic benefits um, and um, that one's on me, uh, cut it, copying and pasting slides, apologies for that. Um, but in terms of the other benefits, so that spending on volunteering, we mentioned before, it, it gave about 1.2 billion um, in you know, profit to producers and businesses across Queensland. Um, it also created employment, um, so it created jobs for people. Um, and also you know, created a return in taxes to, to the economy as well. Together about, there's about 3 billion in, uh, just over 3 billion in employment and a bit in taxes as well. So yeah, uh, about $5 billion in you know, direct economic return there. Um, volunteers labor though. So this is, this is what we call the replacement cost of labor. So if we had to pay volunteers for the roles that they fulfilled, um, and we had to pay, you know, not just their wage, but we also had to pay super and, you know, all our administrative costs that, that come with managing a payroll. Um, if we had to replace those volunteers with paid labour, it'd cost the community or the organisations or um, that the utilise volunteers about $37 billion. Now, that figure is really significant um, because in Queensland, um, I can't remember the exact figure. We only spend about ten and eleven, ten or eleven billion dollars on the public sector uh, at all levels of government. So yeah, you know, local, state, and federal government. There's about ten billion dollars in in, in uh, public sector wages. So the volunteering sector, if you want to treat it as such, is three times the size of the public sector, and they're doing you could you know uh, say at one level a lot of the work that would otherwise be expected to be done by the public sector as well. So that's a really interesting finding. And even compared to the private sector, the private sector wage bill in Queensland is only about $33, $34 billion. So it's slightly bigger again than the private sector. So if we treat volunteering as a, you know, a, a labour market sector in its own right, it's the biggest one in Queensland, <laughs> um, which, is, which is significant. And I, I don't know that many people have thought about it or framed it that way in the past. Um, so that's the big figure. That's the 83.9, which is the, the, the 84 billion uh, that we've been referring to as the value of volunteering, because the value is the sum of the benefits, uh, essentially. And if, you, um, if you're into uh, figures like social return on investment and things like that, well, basically that's benefits minus costs, which is about 63 billion uh, as well. Um, so that in itself is a, is a very significant figure. But the relationship between costs and benefits, 
Effectively, for every dollar that is spent by all the stakeholders on volunteering, and that's you know the money that they pay out of their pocket and the money that they forego in terms of you know opportunity. Um, for every dollar that is invested, we get just over four dollars, or four dollars ten in social and economic returns, which is significant. Because uh, if I could head down to the Treasury Casino right now, and for every dollar I put on the table, I got four dollars back, um, it was guaranteed that as a return. I'd be pretty happy with my lot. <laughs> so it's a it's a really significant um, figure that that return on investment. So where is that the eighty four billion dollars is you know, um, the, the headline um, and the big story out of this. Probably the most significant from an economic point of view is, is this a good investment that, you know, we as a community are making in volunteering? Absolutely, yes, it is. So I'll be answering questions shortly on the panel, um, but thank you very much for your time here today. And um, yeah, um, and I'll also make myself available um, if anyone does want to approach us individually after as well to ask any questions too. So thank you very much and well done, Queensland. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Paul, and it's indeed been a great pleasure to work with you and your team to really kind of nut out and look at volunteering and show the extraordinary value and contribution of volunteering to Queensland. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Minister Enoch, and I'm really sorry you were one of many of us who got caught in traffic this morning, but it's a great, great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll begin in the Jandai language of my people, the Kondamuku people. Yura Naraba Baja Baru Wanya Yura Nya Gurujan Jagajan Turubu Yagara Yura. So to simply say that I acknowledge all of our ancestors and that I, of course, acknowledge the Turubu and Yagara people, the traditional owners of this country that we're meeting on this morning. Can I, of course, acknowledge all of the uh, dignitaries that are here this morning, including Mara, uh, our speakers, and of course, Claire O'Connor, who's the uh, Director General of the department that I have carriage for, and all of you who've taken some time to get through the traffic and be here this morning um, to launch this incredible uh, report about volunteering in this state. Uh, I had all this like posh stuff to say, but after hearing um, what Paul uh, shared with us, I think I want to start with a bit of a story and it's my story of volunteering and I know everybody here has a story of volunteering and my first understanding of what volunteering meant uh, came to me when I was about four or five and my family had a tradition of um, volunteering every weekend uh, didn't matter how old you were in the family that was your job uh, was part of your weekly role was to go and volunteer somewhere our family had a um, aged care facility not far from our home. And I remember my mum and dad, who were not wealthy people. We grew up in Woodridge. You know, this is mum worked all kinds of jobs to make sure there was food on the table for four kids. Uh, they were very young, my mum and dad. Uh, so, uh, but I remember her baking Anzac cookies or whatever she had. Um, that she could put together to be able to provide these cookies and then she'd send us kids off down to the aged care facility and would spend time uh, with some of the older residents at this at this facility and as I got a little bit older maybe six or seven I wanted to go and spend time with my friends and I kept saying to my mum and to my aunties who got involved why do I have to go and do this I want to go and have fun I want to you know go down the road um, play in somebody else's backyard whatever and what they collectively said to me, and I'm paraphrasing it, uh, is probably stuck with me ever since. And that is uh, that every day that you are doing this, you are contributing to what uh, we or you want to see as a community that you live in. This is part of you contributing to what it is that you want your community to be. It's not about what you get back. It's what you are giving so that you are part of this community and you are you are determining what it is, uh, what kind of place you want to live in. And so for me, it was never about how much the cookies cost or how much time I was spending away from my friends or what I, what else I could be doing. It was, okay, this is about the community that I want to live in and this is why I'll be contributing whatever time I can. And that led me to a whole heap of jobs uh, that looked at service. 
from being a teacher to working for Australian Red Cross uh, to now in politics, you know, looking for ways to be able to serve others, to be able to contribute to our community. But of course, over the last um, over the last year, uh, there's no doubt uh, that, of course, the ongoing global pandemic has changed the way that we live our lives. It's actually questioned us about uh, what kind of community we want for the future now. Uh, the isolation has helped us to realise the value of community. Um, and of course, as we um, continue to unite and recover, uh, what COVID-19 has shown us is just how important volunteering in our community really is. Uh, we know that volunteering contributes not only to the well-being of a community, but also to the economic, social, cultural, and environment, environmental fabric of our community. We know Queenslanders love to give others a helping hand. We see it uh, time and time again, and this report quantifies the extent of vol volunteering in our state. Uh, it found, as we've heard, uh, more than 3 million Queenslanders aged over 18 took part in some form of volunteering in 2020, either through an organisation or informally. I looked at that number and went, so more than 3 million Queenslanders, there's only 5 million of us in, in this state. That's, that's a huge number that have taken some time out of their day to contribute to what, it, what this community that we live in, what they want it to be. Um, and so, you know, even when we're hearing things like um, contributing um, on average around 25 hours a month or just under six hours a week of their time. It's incredible. Um, that's the equivalent of more than 900 million hours of volunteering, which is astounding. Um, as well as the pandemic, of course, last year brought devastating bushfires and floods. Queenslanders rolled up their sleeves and dedicated their time and energy to helping others through all of it, an extraordinary effort. And of course, when you think about volunteering, it's not hard to remember back to 2011 when we had the floods and the images of the of the mud army with shovels, gumboots and brooms helping strangers clean up their homes. I know um, myself, I was working for Red Cross at the time and I had my sons uh, who were in their late teens. Uh, they spent their pocket money, if you like, um, money that they had earned to go down and purchase uh, shovels, get gumboots, get gloves to go in and help their family and friends uh, during that time. Uh, and they did that because they've been brought up in this sense of you give to make sure that you're part of this community. Uh, so it's no surprise that last year we saw thousands of Queenslanders sign up to volunteer in our care army to support our seniors and vulnerable people who were self-isolating through the pandemic. Instead of shovels, volunteers picked up the phone to check in and talk to seniors living alone. They swapped gumboots for joggers, running errands, dropping food and medicine at vulnerable people's doorsteps and much, much more. It was um, very heartening, of course, to see that more than 28,000 Queenslanders signed up to be part of the Care Army. Um, it's created a legacy of community spirit and connectedness and that's why the Queensland Government has provided an additional $250,000 to volunteering Queensland for the uh, Care Army Mobilisation Project. This project will broaden the role of Care Army volunteers from their initial focus of supporting seniors at the height of the pandemic to include other vulnerable groups in our community, as well as being called upon to assist during disasters. Uh, in addition to building on the legacy of the Care Army, we are working with our partners uh, in the Queensland Volunteering Action Partnership. The aim is to explore new ways of keeping Queenslanders engaged in volunteering opportunities and help boost volunteering rates across the state. Uh, as this report highlights, the pandemic has significantly disrupted and changed volunteering in Queensland. Between 2019 and 2020, there was a 15.2% increase in volunteering from home or online, resulting in many volunteer involving organisations losing volunteers on the ground. Uh, the government is committed to continuing its valuable relationship with volunteering Queensland and volunteer involving organisations, as well as supporting our volunteers and working to further boost volunteer numbers. The government has provided more than $2 million over five years to volunteering Queensland as the peak body, uh, peak agency. Uh, just this financial year, nearly $1 million was allocated across the volunteering sector. This investment has supported efforts to raise awareness and promote opportunities for volunteering build capacity within the sector and manage the emergency volunteering community response during natural disasters. Uh, 
this funding also included $250,000 allocated to volunteer resource centres to support the mobilisation of volunteers during the COVID-19 pandemic and for future disaster responses. Uh, you know what, I'm going to stop because uh, these are all the numbers that you can read in the report and these are the numbers that uh, you know we utilise to be able to talk about our support for the sector. But volunteering really is about human beings and it's really about our human connection to each other. Uh, and like I said, every single one of you have got a story about that human connection. What a difference each and every one of you and the people that you get to encounter make to other people is actually what volunteering is all about. It's actually about the values of the community. It's not the value to the community, it's the values of the community. And for me, that's what volunteering um, and this report helps us to uh, have some insight into it, but ultimately it is about how we react to each other, how we uh, support each other. Um, and it makes me think of a very famous quote from uh, Winston Churchill. Um, and I hope I get it right now that I talk about it. Uh, but, you know, he, uh, he said, he said, uh, you make a living uh, by what you get. Uh, you make a life by what you give. And that is what volunteering is all about in Queensland. I want to thank every single one of you today for the work that you do. I know it is immense. I know that you make a huge difference in your community, not just to individuals, but to groups of people. Uh, you define our community by your work and the people that you work with help us to define our community. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here to launch this report uh, and I look forward to um, in all the work that we'll continue to do uh, to elevate the understanding and the incredible value of volunteering, uh, not just in terms of its monetary value, but its value in terms of its contribution to what it means for our community. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Minister, and what a beautiful story. Um, and it really does illustrate that spirit of service and giving that volunteering is. It also reminds me of a comment that I hear over and over from volunteers. Um, in all my twen tw just over 20 years in the volunteering sector, I've never, never met a volunteer who hasn't said to me, I gain much more than I give. And that's an extraordinary comment, I think, and it is um, the minister's uh, story reflects uh, that. I also would like to say about Paul and our report, um, our report's not nerdy. <laughs> I've read it many, many times. It's eminently readable. So, um, and I think people will enjoy and be inspired by it, by actually reading the full report, not just the, the summary, although the summary gives a good snapshot. Um, I'd like to say to the Minister that you and your government government support has been greatly valued. Uh, we at Volunteering Queensland look forward to working closely um, with you going forward to both achieve your government's vision and also our vision for volunteering to fully enable volunteering and volunteers to realise their potential um, for the benefit of our state and our community. As you said, it is through volunteering that our community has become far more connected, inclusive, resilient and strong. Um, it's now time for our panel discussion and also some Q&As. I'd like to introduce um, our panel um, moderator, who is Ricky Anderson. Ricky is Volunteering Queensland's Senior Manager of Services. Ricky, together with a talented team, have been hard working and spending long hours analysing the report and working with Paul's team, um, and they are responsible for this exciting piece of work. I extend a thanks to all of our team involved in this. It's been a whole of organisation um, effort for us, and we are very, very proud of our team. Um, may I say that your dedication, your expertise, your drive, and your mutually supportive approach has been greatly inspiring. Ricky will be joined by Paul, who we've already introduced you to, but also Dr Stacey Messer, Acting Director, Department for Communities, Housing and Digital Economy. Stacey has over 20 years experience working in government and in non-government community services sectors. 
in research, evaluation, policy strategy and engagement roles. Stacey joined the Queensland Public Service in 2009, taking on a position in Disability Services Queensland. She has since 2012 worked with and led various teams across the community services portfolio. And Stacey works directly with Volunteer in Queensland. We're very grateful for all of her support and advice and the way she works collaboratively with us. Another panellist is Natasha Doherty. Natasha is a partner with Deloitte Access Economics, leader of Deloitte's policy and program evaluation practice, and is, of course, one of our esteemed board members of Voluntary in Queensland. Natasha works across the public sector, predominantly in health and social policy. Natasha is passionate about evidence-based policy and has taken a great long deal of time to plough through our report to make sure that it's okay, and also practice and has led a number of evaluations for the Commonwealth and state-based reform across health, community services, funding reform, and the innovation agendas. Our fourth member of the panel is Mary Lou Gittens, educator and irrigator from Gumbura Valley in the Upper Condamine catchment, and chair and one of the founders of the Queensland Water and Land Carers a peak body for community natural resource management, volunteer groups in Queensland, comprising over 400 members and involving over 30,000 volunteers. With a strong background in community volunteering, Mary Lou has represented the agriculture and uh, land care um, sector for many, many years and has also been a member of local, regional, state and commonwealth level um, committees for many years. She is also the Secretary of the Condamine Catchment Management Association, Alora Medical Support Group and the Kumbura Town Hall Committee. Welcome to you all and thank you for being, being, um, agreeing to be a, um, our panellist. We look forward to your contribution. I now hand over to Ricky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. And I'm really pleased to be joined by such an esteemed panel of colleagues. We're going to delve right in. I've got a question for each panel member to kick us off and then we will throw out, if we've got time, to some questions from the audience. We do have people streaming online as well, so we will be having a look for any online questions too. So, Paul, I'm going to start with a question for you. Um, we've seen, and it's been noted a few times this morning, that it's just over 75% of the Queensland community volunteer, which is a surprising and figure that we're very proud of. However, the elephant in the room for any of the uh, volunteering data nerds like myself is that it's very different to previous ABS data. So, for example, the 2016 census reported that Queensland had a volunteering rate of just over 18%, which was just under the national average. Why is the finding in this report so different? It really comes down to methodology. And um, for those of you who remember the census, the, the question in the census is, you know, it's question 51 in the census. And it's like, do you, uh, it's essentially how much do you volunteer? Um, and you're meant to put an hour figure um, and move on. Now, the ABS actually recognises that that's a poor way to get a quantum of volunteering in the community. And they have another instrument called the General Social Survey, uh, which you know, most recently they asked 3,000 households across Australia. And they asked a series of questions around volunteering, um, uh, around how people volunteer. But again, the, the questions are, there's, I guess, two real differences in how we go about it. Uh, I think the minister with her story was a, a great example. Where if, you, if you'd have asked her mother, uh, do you volunteer? she probably wouldn't have recognised what she was doing as volunteering. Um, and that's one of the big challenges. Um, so the way we ask our questions now, we ask, do you do any of these sorts of activities? And then we say, okay, well, you've self-identified as a volunteer. Now we're going to ask you about you know, how much you do and when you do it and things like that. The other big difference is that ours is a, a sort of 10 to 15 minute instrument. Uh, you know, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to complete the survey and it's only about volunteering. Um, and one of the problems with, and it's not so much a problem, it's more a, a constraint. 
um, with the, the ABS methods is in the census, for example, which we've all completed, well, hopefully we've all completed or paid the fine or, or whatever, um, the, um, you know, by the time you hit question, 50, question 51, you've been asked about a range of activities and stuff and you're really just powering through to get to the end. Similar with the general social survey, um, it's section 7.2. There's about, you know, there's over 200 questions in the full instrument and, you know, you, and the, it takes about an hour and a half to, to complete. And again, you're probably not giving the full attention to your volunteering activity that you are able to do in a survey like ours. But I think ours fits better with people's intuitive appreciation of volunteering that happens in the community. We, it, it seems you know, unrealistic that only three out of every 10 people volunteer, which is what the ABS is telling us. So, you know, this sort of better fits our intuitive appreciation of it. And it's done through a methodology which we've tested and refined, as we say, with a, a whole heap of different states. And we keep finding very similar results. So I think this is a, a, a true figure. It may not be the perfect figure, but it's a far more accurate representation of the volunteering that happens in our community. Thank you. And I think one of the most important things for us is it's a figure that we can be confident in and it's a new benchmark that we can look at moving forward, which is important. Um, Natasha, I have two questions for you as the other economist on the panel. So again, some figures that have been noted a few times this morning are the 84 billion value in volunteering. It's the figure that the radio is most interested in that I've been talking to a few times this morning. Um, and also the 4.1 return on investment. What stands out to you with your Deloitte hat on about these figures? Yeah, and um, yeah, just to get a little bit nerdy for a little while, Paul, um, and with everybody else, is that it is a significant figure. This is um, this is quite significant. Um, I do a lot of studies in this space. Um, it's bigger than the cost of obesity, if you just put it in that context, in the whole of Australia. So this is a really significant contribution that volunteers are making within our state. Um, but there are three main things that really stick out for me in terms of the numbers in the report. So the productivity benefits are $40 billion. So what's that, what is that saying? That's saying that every person that volunteers, that that has a benefit to their primary um, employment activity in terms of increasing their productivity at work. So that can either be through skills development that they're getting through volunteering. It could be through the networks that they're developing as part of their volunteering activities. Um, and maybe that's advancing um, the opportunities that they have within their workplace to uh, increase both their productivity, but the opportunities that they have as an individual. So that's quite significant in terms of the direct flowback that it's having to our economy. The other aspect is what um, Paul was talking about around the replacement costs. So if we were to replace all activity that's current be currently being delivered by volunteers, that's worth seven, uh, $37 billion to our economy as well. So there's some really significant activities that volunteers are undertaking uh, to improve our society in, in aged care, in sporting, in you know, lots of different fields across um, the fabric of our society. And I love the Minister's comment there around, you know, the giving back is where you get the value. And, you know, that is articulated in these numbers uh, in terms of what it would cost us uh, to deliver some of the fantastic work that volunteers uh, are delivering. And the other aspect, this is a smaller number, but I just wanted to highlight it, was the actual on the cost side. So the costs that volunteers are incurring um, for the activities that they're giving and the fact that um, the, their reimbursement um, has reduced over, over the period of the two years that we were looking at. Now, what that says to me is that volunteers get intrinsic value from the work that they do, which goes to the minister's exact point, um, that they see and they value the work that they're doing, the connections they get from it, uh, and therefore that's showing up in the fact that they're willing to incur those costs. And I think just the other aspect of this, Ricky, you know, talking to the $37 billion, um, that, you know, this is not just in one location. This workforce isn't just in southeast Queensland. You know, it is distributed across our state. It's distributed across our sectors. And I think that's what makes volunteering quite unique in terms of the contribution that it makes to our society. 
Absolutely. Just going on that $37 billion for the labour replacement, um, one of the other really interesting figures that stood out to me was the size of the volunteer workforce. So it is the equivalent, almost the equivalent to the private sector or three times the size of Queensland government. What does that mean for how we should continue to advocate mm. for this workforce into the future? Yeah. Well, I think building on what I t- talked about before, um, you know, it is it is the most distributed workforce when we think of it as a total across the whole state. And so by investing in this sector and investing in the development of volunteers, we're improving not just social outcomes across the whole of our state, but also economic returns that we get from it, which we've demonstrated in the report. Um, And I think it highlights, uh, it was volunteering management being one of the most important aspects that um, VIOs wanted assistance with, you know, and that's where the role of volunteering Queensland comes in to continue to develop those skills within VIOs, to support the way that they manage volunteers, but also enable them to get access to appropriate training um, so they can continue to fulfil their roles. And just the other aspect of this is I think that's been highlighted in the report is the role of technology and then I think the role that volunteering Queensland and volunteering organisations play in continuing to provide access to volunteering opportunities and technology being a really key enabler to that and I think you know there's more work to do there and there's more that we as volunteering Queensland need to be doing to to build out that understanding and to really utilise those technologies as well. Yes, we're looking forward to using the findings and working with volunteer involving organisations to continue to support them as everything evolves um, in our, as we're still in this pandemic landscape, um, which is an excellent segue actually. Stacey, I'm going to direct the next question to you. The volunteering sector has seen so many changes over the last year and a bit, as with all elements of society um, with the pandemic, and we've seen so much disruption. So Paul mentioned this in his findings, and I know the Minister also mentioned it um, in her remarks, is that we've seen a shift in the way people are volunteering. We've seen a shift in the way volunteer-involving organisations are having to structure their volunteering programs. How do you see this affecting the future of the volunteering sector? Thanks, Tricky. Um, I'm so pleased that the impact of COVID is actually in the report. And just as a segue, the the CEO of Volunteering Australia was on um, Breakfast TV um, yesterday morning talking about the impacts of COVID on volunteering. And um, he had um, there was another lady who was a volunteer in the DfE sector who also spoke. But I thought what was fascinating was he really needed this report and the findings because largely what he was speaking about was just the decimation that they felt um, uh, occurred in terms of volunteers and volunteers no longer being able to volunteer because of the pandemic. And certainly this report highlights that um, and there's some really interesting narrative in the report that talks about the impact of um, COVID, not only in terms of um, the disruption to services, but also um, the personal intentions of volunteers. Volunteers certainly saying that COVID has made them fearful um, to continue to uh, volunteer. Um, But there's also where we look at the opportunity for online and technology, um, there's some volunteers that say, well, I can't volunteer in in the way or the capacity that I used to but I do have the opportunity to volunteer online, so I'm going to take up that opportunity. So I think that that's really useful. I think um, I just reflect on what we understand in terms of the department and the impact that COVID had on volunteer-involving organisations, and um, there's absolute consistency in the results of this report with our experience. Services showed tremendous agility, um, creativity and flexibility in how they looked at service responses um, relative to COVID and those COVID impacts. So there were services that could no longer continue delivering and we could no longer continue volunteering in the way that they used to. Um, Our safe night precincts was an example of that. Um, But they looked at the skills that they had as volunteers and recognised that they were still able to contribute to their community and they pivoted um, their role. And I think at the end of the day, they looked at doing some outreach for rough sleepers. 
So that's an incredible way that during COVID, um, at a time when we didn't have much time to plan or um, consider what an evolving service landscape might look like, um, to still continue to support um, um, people in the community. Some of our neighbourhood and community centres um, could no longer continue delivering um, um, some of the supports through volunteers and that's where the online option became um, really vital um, and they were able to continue delivering really important services. It's not to say that some of those services might necessarily continue in the future. Um, I think what it highlights is that the technology is an option for services um, to uh, continue delivering services, be that COVID, or um, if there's um, uh, a need to uh, deliver services um, online or support online in the future as well. Um, I think what one of the things that I, th if we look at the future and what that those results might mean for the future. If I look at what services did in relation to that flexibility and the creativity and agility that they demonstrated, I think it's about how we enable that in the future and how we support um, VIOs and their capacity and capability to be able to demonstrate that fle flexibility moving forward. Um, VIOs across Queensland come in all shapes and sizes. We have some very large VIOs that have tremendous capacity and capability, but we also have some very small community organisations that are entirely volunteer managed and led. Now, their capacity and capability is not going to be anywhere near the same as some very large VIOs. So we need to look at that in terms of, well, what can government do? What can volunteer in Queensland do? What can we do together through the work that we're already supporting to make sure that organisations have that capacity and capability going forward? Um, thank thank you. you. And look, we really look forward to working with you on that because it is Likewise. when we're looking at developing resources and all of the things we need to do to put action to the findings in this report, they do vary for your huge resource volunteer involving organisations to the so many just tiny complete volunteer run. So um, we really look forward to working with all volunteer involving organisations across the state. Mary Lou, you're here representing the volunteer involving organisations on the panel, very important. Um, and there were a number of barriers to volunteering that people noted in the report with the top two being no time and health reasons. How will the findings of this report provide insight and information and help to you as a volunteer involving organisation um, to the environment and the broad volunteering sector in terms of overcoming these barriers when you're looking at engaging volunteers? That's the interesting thing about um, volunteers is actually recognising you're volunteering and, and that's what the Minister said, you know, we don't really recognise what we're doing and within the environment sector, recognising you're a volunteer is, is really an obstacle that we have to educate well, it's not an obstacle, it's actually a challenge that we have to educate our members that they are volunteering. Um, I remember that um, Landcare came into our family and I always claimed it was like the fifth child because um, it became one of our um, directions and we spent a lot of time as a family and also a, through our business and we thought that we it, it was improving our business but we were actually volunteering in a general way. And the establishment here which came through that is about the personal experience and and I really um, believe in that and also our mental well-being there's also a value there in volunteering whilst we may be assisting others or doing other things there's also our own mental well-being and the journey here I think uh, is that personal thing and interesting to say that some of these volunteers said we've never been asked, well non-volunteers, we haven't been asked and so that's a real take home message I think for most of us if you've got volunteers that to personalise that experience and go and look in your community and see if there's someone there that you know, bring a friend, you know have those days of bring a friend and I think that's a way to look at this report and, and establish some of those findings that you can implement within as a volunteer. Thank you. Thank you. And absolutely, yeah, it was a very interesting finding for a lot of people who don't volunteer and we asked why and they said, well, I've, I've never been asked. So interesting one. I think we have time for two or three questions from the floor and online. I'm going to start with the floor 
and I'm looking out at a lot of blank faces, but I know at least someone out there must have a question. So we do have a microphone that can come to you. Put your hand up. I know it's pre 9 a.m. You've all had a coffee though. Any, no burning questions. Paul, you did such a good job. The report is so articulate that it answers everything. Well done. Zach, do we have any online questions? Okay, so the question is, how does this compare to other states and territories? And I think, Paul, I'm going to throw to you. I can share mine. Um, yeah, look, uh, as, as Mara flagged, we've uh, done this in a number of different states and territories over the years. Um, and um, I think the only volunteering jurisdiction we haven't touched now is uh, South Australia Northern Territory, which is a single entity. So um, one of the things that I'm always careful with these reports is we're not trying to set the states up in competition with each other. We're, we're not trying to say that, you know, uh, Queensland volunteering is better than Victoria volunteering and uh, things like that, um, even though we know it's true. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, one of the things we are seeing is fairly consistent findings. Um, I guess the, the, the results aren't perfectly comparable because the, the Tasmanian and West Australian work, for example, was all done pre-COVID, uh, if anyone can remember back that far. Um, Victoria, when we, we looked at them, we our data collection period was right during their second major lockdown. Um, so that obviously had a massive impact on the response rates. But what we are seeing is fairly consistent findings and returns in this respect. So, you know, you're always nervous the second time you do a study like this. Yeah, you know, if it's wildly different, does that mean our methodology is tanked? But that's not been the case. And if anything, you know, even when we've made minor refinements to the method, we're still getting you know, very consistent findings across the state and states and territories. Uh, from our point of view, though, there's so much still that we haven't discovered. One of the things we've talked about, really, the value to the community of volunteering, but we haven't looked at that one segment of the community where the returns are probably exponentially larger again, which is the people who receive the benefits of a volunteer's engagement. So the kids who get soccer coach, the, the adult who participates in a literacy program, you know, the environmental benefits that are, you know, generationally returned through the actions of volunteers. And I think, you know, we can very confidently and safely say that this is a conservative underestimate of the true value of volunteering. Um, and there's so much more out there to be revealed. Yeah, whilst this is wonderful to have all of this data, it's kind of opened Pandora's box for us to an element. Natasha, I know that we've been discussing there's so many different elements of volunteering that we want to do further research into and particularly that altruistic element. Mm, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, this is just sort of like rolled out a whole suite of work that we need to do as volunteering Queensland um, to better understand other elements um, that maybe we, you know, haven't been able to answer as part of this and also work that we need to continue to build on. So, you know, one particular area, and Mary Lou would probably attest to this, is um, rural and uh, regional communities uh, rely so heavily on volunteers and they probably contribute disproportionately to both the social fabric and the economic fabric of those communities. And so, you know, this report has shone a light on broader Queensland benefits and the like, but it would be great to understand in a more intimate detail around the impact that volunteering has and the importance of it um, in our smaller regional um, and remote towns across the state. Uh, other areas, obviously, informal uh, volunteering. So we really need to unpack that a little bit more and look at how we you know, activate that area uh, even further uh, to utilise those people who are sort of, you know, wanting to be part of the more formal sector. Uh, and obviously, just going back to Paul's point um, that he made at the start around the differentials in the ABS data and our data, sort of how do we inform as an organisation some of the changes around how we might collect this uh, information on an ongoing basis to make sure we get sort of better accuracy in the reporting um, so we can understand it on a longitudinal um, perspective. So just some of the things that we'll be doing, but there's a whole list of activities that we have on our agenda. Yeah.
And I think just returning to Zach's or the the, the, the audience question uh, about comparability to other states, one of the things with this report and with, you know, our sample, we can't say with any sort of, you know, confidence that, um, you know, women aged 35 to 44 in remote areas, their volunteering looks like this. But by asking the same questions across all the different states, we're actually building a big enough data set that soon we'll be able to do and be able to make those dives and get much richer data, not necessarily at the Queensland level, but given the consistency with which some of this data is returning, we'll be able to make really strong statements very soon, hopefully, about some of those demographic characteristics of volunteering, whether it's household income, whether it's regionality, whether it's gender, whether it's age, you know, all of these things we'll hopefully be able to dive into soon. Thank you. It's a wonderful start. Mary Lou, did you have a final comment before I hand back to Mara? So, so Paul, I suppose from the, the Queensland Water and Land Carers aspect here, we actually have done for numerous years a survey of our members and we have data and so it would be fantastic for this um, project to interwine and see how we can marry some of the data that we've achieved over the years. may not be up to your... Um, to stand it, but it is <laughs> it is data, and so we would like to see that happening. Well, one of the things we've done here is we've actually, you know, very precisely using ABS data, estimated the replacement cost of you know uh, an eighteen year old versus a, a, a the replacement cost of you know different age cohorts, time, and things like that. And what we'd encourage you know all volunteer involving organisations to do is work with Volunteer in Queensland to use this to help benchmark your um, you know, the way you report, you know, um, your activity and the benefits that your organisations deliver, whether that's in, you know, public relations activity, whether that's through grant applications or things like that. The other things too is if you are surveying your members on a regular basis and your volunteers on a regular basis, um, you know, again, talk to Volunteer in Queensland because, you know, if we can align the questions you ask with the questions that we've asked and that we ask as a sector, again, we get a much richer picture and can do... We don't expect you to do the data analysis, but if you've got that data that is available for Volunteer in Queensland and others to analyse, then, you know, and it's consistent with, you know, the way it's collected and stuff, then we can do so much more with this and we can really start to unpack and get that full story. Thank you. So, so many opportunities. We, we have time for one very quick question because I am conscious it's nearly 9 a.m. Um, I was really interested in the comment about um, people not being asked to be a volunteer. And I'm just wondering whether there was any thought to how you get that message out um, that maybe you don't need to be asked. You just got to go look, go find, you know, invite yourself. Look, absolutely, and I might take that one from a volunteer in Queensland perspective specifically. We're always looking at how we can encourage more people and inspire more people to volunteer and National Volunteer Week is one of our key opportunities in International Volunteer Day to get those stories out there to inspire people. So we would ask for everybody's support and assistance in sharing social media posts and getting that word out there and we'll certainly be taking these findings to look at how we can inform a more comprehensive recruitment campaign across the state over the coming year as well. So I would like to thank all of our panellists. That was wonderful. Um, and hand back to you, Mara. Um, thank you very much. And um, I also would like to thank our wonderful panellists. They were very, very interesting and exciteful um, points that you made and a great discussion. I'd like you to please accept this very small token of our appreciation of your time and um, your expertise today. And thank you, Ricky. Um, I just wanted to bring up one quick point. Mary Lou and I had a wonderful week last week in southwest Queensland delivering training and workshops um, to the many members of Queensland Water and Land Carer and indeed community organisations. And we did get uh, some fabulous insights into regional and remote um, volunteering and just the spirit of volunteering that's there and the never say die attitude and a, a couple of weeks ago I also spent time delivering workshops in central west Queensland and in northwest Queensland and I am always just um, really bowled over by the amount of volunteering and then and the breadth and depth of knowledge of volunteers in regional and remote Queensland so they are 
a very important area for us and I know we're doing some work with Griffith University and we put in an ARC um, funding for the, the, the value of regional and remote volunteering to Queensland so I'm hoping that that piece of research will also get up. Um, in the process of compiling the report we drew on the support guidance, expertise and influence of an expert project management advisory committee comprising members from a diverse range of volunteer areas. Sincere thanks for your contribution to all of those members of our um, project advisory committee. I also extend gratitude and thanks to Queensland Water and Land Carers for their sponsorship. You shared our vision right from the start and we genuinely um, and you have genuine, genuinely and always genuinely champion um, this work and volunteering. And I'd like particularly to thank Daryl. I've had some marvellous conversations uh, with him about the need for research and really the need to engage people to recognise that they are um, contributing to our state and to our nation indeed. So the key question is where to from here? Volunteering Queensland is developing a policy position and advocacy action plan from the findings of this report. This will be launched in late June and it's being undertaken by Zach and Ricky. Um, so keep your eye out for that correspondence. Some key actions we are unpacking include using survey data to identify what volunteer involving organisations need and indeed aspire to and their priorities going forward. Advocating those needs um, at all levels of government, particularly volunteer recruitment and retention, red tape reduction and funding sustainability. Supporting volunteer involving organisations to use the report to improve their advocacy, their pitches, their grant applications, planning going forward and most importantly volunteer management practices. A really beautiful friend of mine who's no longer, um, and sadly she passed away a couple of years ago, named Susan Ellis. She was a, a globally respected leader of volunteering. She says, always said, good volunteer managers make good volunteers. They don't have to be paid, but good volunteer managers make good volunteers. Because as the minister said, volunteering is about human beings. There are lots of emotions, lots of um, factors that come into play when people get together. We have much work to do and now have the evidence-based road, uh, have an evidence-based roadmap to support us collectively to achieve this work. As a sector, we cannot do this in isolation, but need a unified, committed, whole of government, whole of business, whole of community approach. We hope that you will join in and work with us to achieve the best for volunteering and our state. Thank you for joining us today. And again, special thanks to you, Minister. Your, attention, your attendance here has been very much appreciated. Both a full and the summary report is now available on Volunteering Queensland's website and it is page turning stuff so <laughs> I um, really encourage you to, to read it. It's 70 pages but I was just, you know, and I know I'm in the area but I still found it really, really fascinating. Please contact Volunteering Queensland if you have any comments, any ideas um, that arise from the report. We are always open to productive partnerships that benefit volunteering and through volunteering our community. Happy reading, enjoy the rest of the day and happy National Volunteer Week. We hope that you wear the badge proudly during this week. Thank you for your attendance. So I